in an increasingly modern age. Industry has spread to almost every corner of the globe, managing the raw materials to fuel an ever-increasing population. However, as we mine, transport, and store volatile substances, we are constantly at risk of disaster. We have confirmed fatalities. Hundreds have perished due to the improper storage of chemicals. The Tianjin explosion is one of the most terrifying pieces of footage. <laughs> 500,000 people, they got affected. Ecosystems have been ravaged. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill was absolutely devastating in terms of its ecological impacts. And nations have suffered from nuclear fallout. As industry only continues to grow, we must examine the cause of each great disaster and safeguard ourselves from horror striking again. Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind, as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? Human beings have been tapping the world's oil and gas at a rapid rate. Industrial oil wells have been operating around the globe since 1859. As easily accessible wells have dried up, we've been required to access remote reserves, like those deep below the ocean. These operations require extremely sophisticated equipment, mining rigs like the Deepwater Horizon, Drilling is a very technical thing. It's very impressive what they do. Um, they're operating in very deep water, one and a half kilometers deep. They can't anchor their drilling rig to the seafloor in that situation, so it's a floating drilling rig. Huge, massive piece of equipment that floats there and is dynamically positioned, which means it has its motors constantly running and its propellers uh, turning to keep it in the right place using a GPS system. So it's just sitting there absolutely on station the whole time. In 2010, the Deepwater Horizon was carrying out drilling operations in the Gulf of Mexico. The warm waters of the Gulf are some of the strongest ocean currents in the world and home to more than 29 marine mammal species. This was an exploration drilling operation. Uh, the geologists had told them there's probably oil and gas down there. So this was to determine just where it was and how much was down there. It was a potentially dangerous operation. The 560 million US dollar rig was owned by Transocean, but was being leased to BP at the time. The exploratory oil well was just 80 kilometers offshore. <laughs> surrounded by over 5,500 kilometers of populated coastline, of which the four major industries were fishing, shipping, tourism, and oil. So to drill, they first of all got to drop their equipment down through one and a half kilometers of water to the seabed. And then they've got to go through about four kilometers of rock. It was challenging work, but finally, five and a half kilometers below the rig, they struck oil. However, 
due to a culture of negligence and reckless conduct, underpinned by corporate greed, one of the largest environmental catastrophes in US history lay just around the corner. Humanity owes a lot to man-made fertilizers, chemicals like ammonium nitrate. Without ammonium nitrate as artificial fertilizers, we wouldn't be able to produce the amount of food we have to sustain the world's population. The industrial storage of such a widely used product should not pose risk. By itself, ammonium nitrate is not that dangerous a substance. It can be transported in a pure state. But as soon as you start to mix in some amount of a carbon-based material, then it can have more explosive properties. Introduce as little as 0.2% of a carbon-based material, and ammonium nitrate is compromised. Add the smallest of sparks, and it almost instantly breaks down into two gases, nitrous oxide and water vapor. The rapid conversion results in an explosion. The explosive potential of ammonium nitrate is utilized in commercial mining for excavation. And sadly, it's also been used by terrorists. In the infamous Oklahoma bombing, ammonium nitrate resulted in the deaths of 168 people. Negligent storage of the chemical fertilizer can have similar devastating results. At the West Fertilizer Company in the city of West in Texas, ammonium nitrate was being stockpiled for the purpose of enriching farming soil. However, on April 17, 2013, the plant caught fire. And we're sitting there watching the fire and then lots of big explosion happened. Next thing I know, shrapnel was falling down everywhere, burning all of us, and we just got out and ran. It's estimated that around 30 tons of ammonium nitrate exploded. The force of the explosion was the equivalent of about 11 tons of TNT. More than 150 buildings were damaged or destroyed. Right now, we have a tremendous amount of injuries probably over 100 injuries. We do have confirmed fatalities. 15 people lost their lives. The unstable nature of ammonium nitrate has long been recognized, well before it was synthesized for industrial use in 1909. So how could such a disaster result in such a toll? There were a number of factors that contributed to the severity of the accident. Firstly, the fertilizer plant was not in an isolated area. Some of the buildings were up to 50 meters away, including playgrounds, schools, and a nursing home. The nursing home was obliterated by a shockwave equivalent to a 2.1 magnitude earthquake. Concerned locals quickly rushed to the aid of the home's residents. When we got to the retirement home, there were some people that were just trapped in the rooms. They had sheetrock that was on top of them. You had to remove that. The halls were, had debris in it. Further to the nursing home, a school was located nearby. Fortunately, it wasn't a school day. Otherwise, there would have been a lot more injuries, uh, especially with people watching the, the burning fire. It seemed extraordinary that a school could be so close. As the city of West developed, more and more buildings were built closer to the fertilizer plant without any consideration of what was stored there. There were no zoning restrictions that prevented residences, schools, and businesses from being built so close to such a hazardous facility. Many residents were not aware of the risks posed by the plant. The West Volunteer Fire Department were also ill-informed. Responding to the blaze, the firefighters were unprepared for an ammonium nitrate-related emergency. Ill-equipped to assess and manage the disaster, 12 of the 15 killed in the explosion were emergency responders. No words, 
adequately describe the courage that was displayed on that deadly night. Thank you so much. Investigators tried to make sense of the tragedy, but the cause of the initial blaze was never determined. But they did reveal a range of inadequate practices, managing, transporting, and storing the ammonium nitrate. One, the fertilizer was stored in a wooden building, which clearly is a problem when it comes to things combusting. Two, it appears that they would transfer ammonium nitrate from different storage bays that may introduce contaminants that could have potentially accelerated the combustion of the ammonium nitrate. The residents of West Texas suffered a very real tragedy, but many of the same conditions and failings would cause a much greater disaster in China only two years later. The coastal metropolis of Tianjin is the fourth most populated city in China, home to more than 15 million people. It is the largest port in the north of the country and serves as a depot for a variety of goods. August 12th, 2015. Among the containers populating the harbor, a hazardous chemical storage facility owned by Rui Hai Logistics stockpiled a range of volatile substances. Regulations requiring the facility to be located at least one kilometer away from public buildings were ignored. And just as in West Texas, many local residents were unaware of the present dangers. That evening, an escalating series of events would trigger a sequence of disasters. The Tianjin explosion is one of the most terrifying pieces of footage I've ever seen. Just when you think the explosion can't get any bigger, there's another explosion. Let's go. Let's go the detonations injured around 800 people and killed at least 173. But it could have been much worse. Fortunately, the accident happened at night, outside of the port's peak operating hours. Reports of a fire at the facility had begun circulating around 10.50 p.m. Firefighters soon arrived on the scene. Unable to contain the blaze, they attempted to quench the fire with water. It was a fatal error. The emergency responders were unaware that there were tons of calcium carbide stored at the site. Calcium carbide is a compound that reacts with water to produce acetylene gas. Acetylene gas is a very, very dangerous material. There's a lot of energy stored in acetylene. A small balloon of acetylene would be enough to deafen me if I was to ignite it in front of me. This is a very, very powerful reaction. Unaware, the firefighters had generated explosive conditions. So the first fireball was caused by the detonation of the acetylene. However, the acetylene was not the only volatile substance stored on site. Paperwork was later discovered, revealing an 800-ton stockpile of ammonium nitrate at the warehouse. The initial explosion had exposed the ammonium nitrate to contaminants, triggering a second. So the second explosion was on the order of uh, 20 tons of TNT being ignited. This is a massive, massive explosion. So the shockwave blew out windows, caused glass to fly through people's accommodation. And then there were questions around contamination from chemicals from the blast. Fires caused by the initial explosions 
continued to burn uncontrolled throughout the weekend. But that wasn't the only problem. The explosions had blasted calcium carbide across the neighborhood. If you have calcium carbide blown away from the, from the scene of the explosion, you could easily have that littered in the streets, which could then form a settling if it was to get wet. In other words, there was the potential for mini explosions if it rained. In the aftermath, local residents protested, frustrated that such a dangerous plant was so close to their homes and seeking compensation for all that they had lost. But much more distressing were the distraught families of firefighters still missing days after the blast. Final counts revealed that 95 firefighters perished in the accident. The inquiry determined that the chemicals themselves should have been safe. It was the manner in which they were stored which was to blame. They weren't licensed to store the quantities of materials that were present, um, particularly with the proximity to, to homes. The explosions of Tianjin aren't the only example of negligence and poor safety practices compounding in a series of escalating events to create a wide disaster. After securing the oil well in the Gulf of Mexico, the exploratory crew on the Deepwater Horizon were already turning their attention to future projects. This is an exploration rig. They've done their job. They've got to move on. And then at some later stage, much later perhaps, a production vessel will come in and connect this well to production facilities and away they go. Oil wells, in essence, are just very deep holes in the Earth's extremely high pressure crust. To stop the oil and gas exploding out of them, they must be sealed securely. What you have to do is put in a cement plug at the bottom of the well, make sure it's working properly, uh, so that it will stop the oil and gas layers that may want to come in and force their way up the well. So that cement plug is absolutely critical. With the cementing complete and deemed successful, the crew stopped monitoring the well, but they should have never underestimated the pressures deep underground. On the 20th of April, something terrible happened. Highly flammable oil and natural gas somehow burst its way up the well toward the rig. So this material erupts with enormous force on the deck of the deep water horizon and it finds an ignition source. Explodes with enormous fury, a massive fire. The initial explosion engulfed 11 workers close to the source. We have no idea where the 11 people that unaccounted for personnel are at this time, and we're going to continue to search. The bodies of those 11 were never found. The fire is still burning. It's a hot fire. It's on the rig itself. It's coming up the riser to the rig. Our, our effort must be to, to put the fire out. Supply boats descended upon the oil rig, battling the blaze. Actually, we were trying to take the load. 115 people were evacuated, and the Coast Guard airlifted the crucially injured to hospitals. The fire could not be subdued. It burnt the rig for two whole days before the rig finally sank. The blaze was finally quenched, but now a different disaster was unfolding. You've still got this release of oil and gas coming from the sea floor. The catastrophe was far from over and it would continue to cascade into the worst environmental tragedy in US history.
Over the decades, chemical pesticides have kept crops free of invasive pests. To produce these chemicals in industrial quantities, large facilities must handle extremely toxic substances. Neglectful management of these substances can have fatal outcomes. India, 1984. The Union Carbide India Limited Pesticide Plant was situated inside a highly concentrated shanty town in the city of Bhopal. On December 2nd, there was an incident at the plant which resulted in a release of gas that flowed into the surrounding neighborhood. The accident happened in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, many people were sleeping. A lot of people, they got gassed. The citizens of Bhopal were unaware that they were in the midst of the world's worst industrial disaster. Something around 2,300 people, they died overnight. But that was merely the immediate fatalities. Others exposed to the gas received horrific injuries. And with time, the death toll steadily mounted. Fast forward to the 30th anniversary of Bhopal, 2014 December. According to a report of Amnesty International, 23,000 people died as a direct result of Bhopal. The plant that unwittingly released the toxic gas was owned by America's Union Carbide, which would later be sold to Michigan's Dow Chemical Company. As the decades crawled on, victims and activists around the world would protest the actions of Union Carbide as further generations continued to suffer the fallout from the disaster. Those affected would burn effigies of the then Union Carbide CEO, Warren Anderson, and call for some form of recourse for their pain. People have suffered enough. They won't let Dow do business in India till it cleans up the toxic waste in Bhopal. It wasn't the product pesticide that killed. It was one of the chemicals used to make it, methyl isocyanate. So in Bhopal, they were using methyl isocyanate to produce the pesticide carbaryl. They weren't producing that much at the time of the explosion, so they were stockpiling the methyl isocyanate in underground tanks. The extremely large quantities of methyl isocyanate, or MIC, should never have been stockpiled on site. The quantity of gas released was 42 tonnes. 42 tonnes, when we expand it into a gas, is about six Olympic swimming pools full of the gas. Methyl isocyanate remains lethal, even when extremely diluted. And on December 2nd, it was released inside a densely populated area. The pure quantity meant that it was impossible for people to get away from the gas. Only a small quantity of MIC is required to reach toxic levels. And people quickly inhaled it. If it gets into your lungs, it can damage the tissues, leading to them filling with fluid, and you can effectively suffocate with your own lungs. For the 2,300 victims on December 2nd, it was a horrible death. How could so many people be exposed to such a dangerous substance? The tanks at the pesticide plant, which contained the excess MIC, were somehow contaminated by an unknown water source. So it appears that a quantity of water was added to the MIC tank. That leads to decomposition of the methyl isocyanate. The decomposition produced heat, and that led to the disaster. Methyl isocyanate boils at just under 40 degrees Celsius. So that heat inside of a massive tank very quickly boils the methyl isocyanate, giving the liquid into a gaseous form. The gas exceeded the volume of MIC in its liquid form, 
and continued to expand beyond the confinements of the tank until finally it leaked. Union Carbide paid out $470 million in compensation to the Indian government in 1989, placing responsibility for the cleanup in the hands of local officials. 336 tons of hazardous waste is still present at the dilapidated plant to this day. Despite an order from the Supreme Court directing the state government to clean up the site. तो हमारी लड़ाई है मतलब छह मांगों की कि हम लोगों को पुनर्वास चाहिए इलाज चाहिए रोजगार चाहिए जो हम लोगों की मजबूरी है हम लोग आपको बताएं क्या हम किलों से दवाएं खा गए और आज भी हम लोगों के बेगों में दवा है और हमें इस बात का खुद दुख हुआ कि सरकार पानी नहीं पिला पा रही तो खाना क्या खिलाई इंडिया चार्ज द यूनियन कार्बाइड सीईओ वॉरेन एंडरसन विद मैन स्लॉटर but he remained a fugitive from Indian justice until the day he died. I think the real tragedy is that the individuals and agencies responsible remain unpunished so far, even after causing the worst corporate massacre in history. Seven former senior employees in the Indian subsidiary were found guilty of death by negligence. Many locals thought the sentences they received weren't enough especially given the level of negligence. In the Gulf of Mexico, Deepwater Horizon's uncapped well was spewing oil into the ocean at an alarming rate of almost 10 million liters a day. You've still got this release of oil and gas coming from the sea floor. And the next job that BP needed to do then was to find a way to cap that. Terrifyingly, there was no obvious solution. They didn't have the technology at hand to do it. They had to improvise. While BP scrambled for solutions beneath the ocean, cleanup crews leapt into action on the surface. Um, and today, in a, in a, especially over the next couple of days, are going to be very critical days out at the well site. Uh, our focus today was uh, to look at the skimming and in situ burning activity. Operations involving the Defense Force dropped almost three million liters of experimental dispersants at the site of the wellhead. The purpose was to break down the oil so that smaller droplets in the water were more easily consumed by microbes. However, action at the site could not keep up with the amount of oil released, and cleanup efforts ballooned to involve 7,000 vessels and 47,000 people. Planes and helicopters crisscrossed the ocean, collecting aerial data in an effort to map the spread of the oil and coordinate response teams. Satellite imagery provided projections of the oil's path. For this whole response, we've used every technological technique we have available and reports from the public to identify where the oil is and where it may be going. Amongst health and safety concerns, commercial fishing operations were shut down. However, many fishermen, witnessing the destruction of their livelihood, turned their efforts to helping contain the spill. We're ready to hurry up and get out there and try to save something. To cordon off slicks, containment booms were deployed, floating barriers designed to prevent the spread of surface oil. Small vessels would then collect what they could. Uh, the big focus of our operations right now would be on water skimming, try to deal with the oil as far offshore as we can. We're being inhibited right now by the weather. Efforts were hampered and the spread of oil worsened as waves driven by Hurricane Alex pushed oil to the beaches. Unencumbered by the rough conditions, a Taiwanese oil tanker exceeding the length of three football fields was deployed to the Gulf. The tanker was repurposed and refitted to ingest 75 million liters of oil-infected water per day. Once collected, it was hoped that tanks on board would distill the mixture 
separating the oil before returning the water to the sea. Unfortunately, the oil skimming capabilities of the tanker turned out to be negligible in contrast to the smaller operations dotting the Gulf. Further ecosystems were contaminated as the oil reached the marshlands. Uh, this crew in front of you is using a drum skimmer to collect oil out of the marsh through the least intrusive means available. But crews would continue to fight a losing battle until the well could be kept. BP had made various attempts, but it was 85 days after the disaster before they had success. Eventually, two relief wells were drilled, each intersecting with the original borehole. Cement was then pumped in, stemming the tide of oil. By September 19th, the well was declared safe. But by now, the environmental catastrophe was enormous. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill stands as the largest oil spill disaster in U.S. history. It surpassed the Exxon Valdez oil spill that happened in 1989 and also was larger than the oil spills that were caused by Hurricane Katrina. Almost 500 million liters of oil were disgorged into waters rich in marine life. Furthermore, the cleanup methods also caused alarm, as the dispersants used were essentially delivering further petroleum on top of the oil. Then this may have created a second major environmental disaster that we also need to be thinking about is there's the oil, and then there's what we put on top of the oil to try to disperse it. Some environmental organizations fear that the dispersants contained hazardous toxins and cancer-causing agents, whilst posing a direct threat to sea turtles and bluefin tuna. Countless marine organisms died. Disastrous environmental consequences. People will have seen these very sad pictures of pelicans and other large birds coated in oil and dying a slow and miserable death. The devastation of marine life had domino effects on related industries. Be fishermen, that's my only source of income. Uh, and I, honestly, I don't want to get in the oil cleanup business if I don't have to. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill was absolutely devastating to many of the coastal communities along the Gulf Coast that really rely on shrimping, fishing, and other resource industries that are that are concentrated in that area. Well, I'm just hoping once they clean it up that it ain't years until we go catch oysters again, you know? That's the only thing I've ever done. That's the only thing I know. Uh, the cleanup took many, many, many months to, to bring about, and uh, I don't know whether the fishing industry has yet recovered to where it was. As the impacts continued to spread far and wide, there was no doubt who was to blame. BP is responsible for this leak. BP will be paying the bill. However, the inquiry into the cause of the devastating accident would uncover further revelations of their culpability. The Ukrainian town of Pripyat was founded in the 70s to service the nearby Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Once a thriving home to 50,000 people, it has laid desolate and decaying for over three decades since the citizens fled in 1986. On the 26th of April, there was an explosion in reactor number four at the Chernobyl power plant. A nuclear meltdown was in progress, although the operators didn't initially realize. Operators thought it was just a simple explosion and that they started to run to see what is happening. They arrived to discover a fire had broken out and the nuclear core was exposed. 
When these operators came back to the control room, the skin went dark just as that you get an intense suntan because of the exposure that they got to the radioactivity over there. This is called nuclear tan. The operators were only exposed for a matter of minutes, but were already suffering radiation sickness. The body is bombarded with energy from neutrons and, and the decaying nuclei. You can have skin burns where you've had large amounts of radiation onto the skin. You can have central nervous system shut down. You can have cardiovascular shutdown. A lot of them suffered and some of them died because of radiation poisoning. Nuclear reactors around the world vary in design, but essentially they all generate electricity in the same way. The nuclear reactor core is where the nuclear reaction takes place. The fissile material exists and it generates heat. The heat which is generated in the nuclear core gets absorbed by the cooling water. Water is very high pressure and super hot. Then it generates the steam and the steam runs your turbine and the turbine is connected to generator and the generator generates electricity. On the tragic day of April 26th, operators at the Chernobyl plant were trying to determine whether the plant would function in the advent of a power failure. Operators were starting to run a test, and the test was to see how the reactor cooling system starts to work at a low power. The reactor was lowered to only 6% of its normal output. The control rods, which slow the reaction of the uranium, were automatically lifted from the reactor. The power suddenly surged, and the control rods could not be lowered back. Cooling water started to evaporate, and the rapidly expanding steam blew the reactor's cover. The blown cover kicked off a chain of disasters as a gigantic refueling machine situated above toppled into the reactor, triggering a series of explosions. The Chernobyl power plant was compromised, and radiation was now leaking into the nearby Soviet town of Pripyat, home to many of the plant's employees. Even people that were sitting in the city of Pripyat, the plant employees, they were doing sunbathing at the time that reactor was exploding and burning over there because Soviets, they did not inform the public. And this is, to me, is a big tragedy and travesty and crime against humanity, that you expose your own people to radiation and not telling them to take cover. The firefighters first at the scene had no idea what they were dealing with. These firefighters arrived, they were totally ill-equipped. In fact, they are considered, uh, the nickname for them, they were human robots or liquidators. And they started to basically extinguish the nuclear fire with water. And some of them, they even took the pieces of the graphite, which was blown out from the guts of the reactor by shovel, and they carried that with shovel. They were badly exposed. But firefighters weren't the only responders to suffer. The World Health Organization revealed that 240,000 recovery workers toiled at the site in the two years following the event. Of these people, tens of thousands died, and many more were left disabled. While the Soviet Union would hail the liquidators as heroes, many struggled to have their participation in the cleanup recognized, as a new Russia distanced itself from the mistakes of the past. However, those close to the Chernobyl site were only the first to suffer. A radioactive plume continued spewing from the reactor. The cloud carried cesium-137, which requires 30 years to reduce to half of its radioactive potency. The plume or the fallout came out from the reactor. It started to travel uh, toward east.
but of all the former Soviet republics to suffer the radioactive plume, Belarus was worst hit. There was a rain that came after a few hours. That's why the city of Gomel, that city and the agricultural land around there is one of the most heavily contaminated. Agricultural land would need to remain fallow well into the following century. But at the time, the Soviet Union concealed the dangers from their own people. Many Belarusian infants suffered severe birth defects from exposure. Some children were born deaf or blind, where others had such severe brain damage that they barely had basic animal reflexes. Eventually, the radioactive plume was detected in Sweden, and it was only then that the world learned of the disaster. In the following weeks, the cloud of radioactivity wafted across Europe. Wherever it encountered rainfall, radioactivity washed out and contaminated the ground below, contamination that would remain to this day. There was an issue recently in the Czech Republic where boars were eating wild fungus. The fungus had concentrated cesium, and therefore the boars were quite radioactive to the point where it was recommended people don't eat the meat. At present, more than five million people live in areas that are considered to be contaminated from the Chernobyl accident. And the question remains to this day, how could such a disaster happen? The root cause of the problem at Chernobyl was the safety culture. It was the safety culture at the plant level and safety culture at the Soviet Union nuclear industry level. There was a very strong hierarchical management structure. It was difficult for workers to question unsafe procedures. These frontline operators, some of them, they objected to that procedure for running the test. In fact, there are several documents about that. If their views were given higher priority, perhaps the tragedy would have been avoided. Attempting to contain the disaster, the Soviets encased reactor four in 200 cubic meters of cement. The sarcophagus was hastily completed on the 22nd of December, 1986. But there was a problem. The enclosure was only designed for an average lifetime of 25 years. As the years passed by, the threat of Chernobyl hung over Europe. In 1992, the Ukraine government held an international competition for proposals to construct a new containment facility. 394 entries were received. However, only one proposed a sliding arch, limiting the amount of time workers would need to be at the site. After seven years of construction, the new confinement structure was rolled over Reactor 4 in 2017. Even with the reactor sealed, some locations in the vicinity of Chernobyl won't be inhabitable for another 20,000 years. The disaster in Ukraine is far from forgotten, and the mistakes made, exacerbated by pressures from upper management, continue to plague industry today. Just six months after the Deepwater Horizon sank, over 8,000 animals were dead, adding further pressure to some already endangered species. The inquiry into the spill would reveal a number of pressures and corporate and government missteps helped generate the disaster. Stop the madness now! Shut them down! 
One of the most notable factors concerned the concrete plug installed to stem the well. The engineers had chosen a, a design for the construction of that well, which made it particularly difficult to get a good cement job. They'd done that in order to minimize cost and maximize speed. They knew that this was going to increase the risk of cement failure, but they went ahead and did it anyway. The engineers ignored the risks in order to placate their bosses, the drilling managers. Those drilling managers are the people who will determine their future careers, and they know very well that in order to satisfy those drilling managers, they need to maximize speed, uh, minimize costs. So they basically accept second best engineering practice in order to satisfy those drilling managers. The lack of independence between the managers and the engineers created an environment of compromised safety. It's a sad day when someone could kill 11 people on an oil rig and then not be held accountable. Tests were performed to ensure the security of the plug, but monetary pressures would determine the outcome. So they did the test. The test result showed that at the first opportunity, this well was going to blow out. That was what the test result showed. But the company ignored their own results. So they redo the test in other ways. They find ways to reinterpret the results they've got. And eventually, they convince themselves that the cement job is good. The pressures to work fast were purely financial and added to the eventual failure. One of the really root causes of the accident was the speed at which they were drilling, and they weren't drilling carefully enough. BP hired the Deepwater Horizon rig from Transocean, costing the best part of a million dollars a day. The pressure on BP to drill fast is overwhelming. They have a variety of incentive systems to make sure that everyone is focused on drilling as fast as they possibly can. So the rate of drilling becomes a key performance indicator which is included in the bonus systems which all these workers are eligible for. So the pressure to drill as fast as they can is just irresistible. And as we know, speed in that situation is the enemy of safety. There were a series of checks and controls in place to minimize the impact of a breach. But due to technical failure and oversight, none prevented the disaster. The Deepwater Horizon accident encapsulates a culture concerned with risking safety and the environment in favor of profits. Well, trials are about justice, and this is justice that's been a long time coming. The savings they made were minuscule in comparison to the costs, the various decisions they made cost them $60 billion. In our modern age, people across the planet have benefited greatly from the advancements and products of industry. However, exploitation of workforces and a disregard for vital safety procedures places ecosystems and communities at risk of catastrophe. It depends upon how rigorous these companies are in putting in place procedures um, and following those procedures. A strict regard for safety must permeate every level of industry. Pay attention and then go for a healthy safety culture at the level of executives all the way to the level of plants. Corporations must constantly assess their own practices as a safeguard against the next disaster. Absolutely, it's possible for this to happen again. And have plans in place in the advent of calamity. This is a lesson that we have to apply to everywhere in the world. Always think about unthinkable.